acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. Welcome everyone. I understand that uh, due to a quirk with Eventbrite, some tried registering at 11 a.m. rather than 12 noon. So I'm sorry that we had that uh, shaky start, but with no further ado, it's wonderful to have you here today. And I am going to share my screen. Not that this is gonna be PowerPoint heavy, uh, but there we go. All right, so um, the purpose of today's update, info update, is really to ensure that we maintain open lines of communication. Um, and I just want us to, to make sure that we're all on the same or shared understanding of where we are with the Hass and Indigenous Research Data Commons. Um, we're all here because we heard uh, the wonderful news in the 2020 Research Infrastructure Investment Plan of support uh, for the first steps in the Hass and Indigenous Research Data Commons. Uh, so I thought it was really important that we didn't leave too long a gap uh, before we brought the community together. So first of all, um, we all know that funding was committed by the federal government back in October and that ARDC uh, will be the lead agent in this space. So this morning I'm going to just share a little bit about what ARDC is working on at the moment, why it fits. Um, I'm going to provide the broader context, what's happening in the national research infrastructure space at the moment, and what are the implications for this work, how this work has the opportunity to provide a really strong foundation uh, for the space, and then where we're up to in the specifics of this activity. As I say, it's more of a, a general information sharing and update that we can obviously have a question and session at the end. So, there we go. Now, uh, the, the uh, I might not want to do that. I'm not sure what that's sharing. I'll just stick with this. So the Australian Research Data Commons um, incorporated as a company limited by guarantee back in May, 2019. Um, and you'll understand why I'm emphasizing this a little bit further on. But uh, it's a not-for-profit, and we have, I'm very pleased, I'm very pleased to say that this slide is just out of date because we have reached 19 uh, university members plus CSIRO just last week. Um, so we have the membership across the country, and you can see that our staff are hosted by universities across the country as well. And ARDC very, very simply uh, has the purpose to provide Australian researchers with competitive advantage through data. When we talk about a mission to accelerate research and innovation by driving excellence in the creation, analysis, and retention of high quality data assets. So that's the mindset that we bring to these activities. Since establishment, we've worked with five different themes. Uh, the commitment of the members is really embracing the shared vision um, as we're delivering it through these five different themes. So you can see them there, data and services, storage and compute, software and platforms, and people and policy. And of course, uniting all of that, we have the coordination and coherence. Now, I want to spend just a moment talking about uh, where we sit with the four themes um, and how that will uh, lead into where we have the interconnectedness of the research data commons. So ARDC, it comes from um, a very, very strong heritage in joining together ANS, Nectar and RDS, so three previous uh, absolutely visionary research infrastructures coming together and providing a portfolio that includes some ongoing services such as the National Information uh, Infrastructure, uh, the Nectar Research Cloud 
activities in the skills and the policy space that really underpinning um, contributions that work across every discipline. And then on top of that, we have the platforms and software and the data and services open calls that we ran in 2019 and 2020. Um, many of you will have engaged in these open calls and we have a series of projects that are currently underway. Uh, and I know that some of you uh, on the call today are active participants in those projects. So it's in um, concert with these, in parallel with these, that we'll be working on PATH and Indigenous Research Data Commons. But we're all doing it under the ENCRIS uh, larger research infrastructure framework. So the merger of ANS, Nectar and RDS came following the 2016 National Research Infrastructure Roadmap, uh, which also spoke about the need for investment in the HAS space as well. One thing that uh, I, I think since 2015, it's a huge change, but it's incredibly positive that the government have committed to a particular cycle in the research infrastructure roadmaps. And that's what I want to highlight today. So we have the 2016 roadmap, the government response to that was in 2018 with a research infrastructure investment plan. And that was the, um, that was the plan that brought the ARDC together. And it was also the 2020 Research Infrastructure Investment Plan uh, that created the current uh, funding for the project we're talking about today, the 8.9 million. But that particular cycle of a roadmap followed by two research infrastructure investment plans is a pattern that has been set out by government. One roadmap, two investment plans. The first is the government response. Uh, to the roadmap and the second is a, a top up or new activities that were identified in the roadmap. And so now uh, this leads us to the 2021 National Research Infrastructure Roadmap Consultation. Um, the fact that this is running at the same time as the HAS and Indigenous Research Data Commons activity is an enormous opportunity for us as a community to demonstrate the foundations uh, for future and increased support in this sector. So it really is providing us with the opportunity to shine. A little bit about the timelines. At the end of 2020, uh, the NCRIS community were asked to consider um, some chapter headings effectively for the research infrastructure roadmap coming up. Um, all of the chapter headings uh, or the possible framework, so one of them was the same as the 2016 roadmap. Another example was to use mission driven um, uh, categories for investment. Another one was based on international models. However, one of the things that unites all of those uh, is a commitment to the e-research infrastructure. But we're now, um, this is very, very front of mind for us at ARDC, early February, we are in what's known as an ideas jam. Um, the department have recognized, much like today's discussion, uh, that consultations during 2021 are for the best part going to be online. So they have, um, they have appointed a consultancy, an external consultancy, to help them with the online delivery uh, of the roadmap in consultation sessions. And the platform is being tested uh, this week, last week and this week, so we're in week two, with an ideas jam for the increase capabilities uh, where we're really posting some of our thinking for what could come in the future. The expectation is very much that the bugs and the quirks and the, the learnings for this online platform will be ironed out now. And a, a broad 
consultation phase will be taken um, over the coming months. I mean, we've put March to September here. Uh, the conclusion and the submission of the next roadmap um, is expected in October of 2021. That's all we know about the timelines at the moment. Uh, but I am stressing it because I do feel we are really focused on laying excellent foundations uh, with the work that we, we're here together to discuss in the HASS space. So keep that in mind. Going on then, the uh, scope of work that we're dealing with at the moment, it absolutely isn't a blank sheet of paper. Um, we don't have a contract from the uh, Department of Education at this stage, but we do know that these um, four particular activities are what we will be asked to deliver on. So it's, it's really quite specific. Um, the way that uh, we take these forward, of course, is what, what we're up to developing now, but we have a very clear, um, a very clear task given to us by the Department of Education to deliver in this space. So you can see the four of them here. Uh, I don't suppose there are any surprises because it's exactly the same text as used in the government re releases uh, and on our website as well. So we have the high level description of the projects. We don't have the contract yet. And I understand that uh, one of the things that's being tweaked is simply the NCRIS guidelines that will support the contract. So we're, we're just waiting for that. We're not uh, concerned by that. And indeed, the next step is that ARDC will undertake uh, recruitment of a program manager to advance us to the next stage. Now, we have a well-developed uh, position description for the program manager and we anticipate that we will be recruiting very very soon so very short term um, as soon as that is finalized and then we'll have the program manager on board uh, in advance of the contract. The first thing that we will be required to do under the contract for each of these four components of the project is to complete an activity plan. Now, an activity plan, uh, again, it's, it's not a blank sheet of paper. It's a very specific uh, template with word limits um, that the Commonwealth will be requiring us to submit. And we will have four of them, one for each of these components. The activity plan sets out what will be achieved uh, in the project, what the milestones will be, what the funding will be. So it really is a, it's a short document, but it's an important document. And the role of the programme manager will be working with the relevant communities and stakeholders to put those activity plans together. So it's the it is the first step, but it's a big step. Now, with these uh, different activities that we've got here, the four different streams, there are um, obviously different foundations, different backgrounds. Uh, they're each at different parts in their own journey. So for example, I spoke about the ARDC open calls, the uh, data assets creation, and the platforms for analysis of software. And already uh, the linguistics data commons is being supported by completely um, separate ARDC projects. That, that's fantastic. It allows us to get a, a very rapid start, use it as a launching pad for going into the next stage. Some of these other areas, uh, there will be the need for more discussion and more consideration uh, to understand what's possible in these first stages. So that will be the work of the program manager with the stakeholders and with the research community. 
And a couple of other things I want to talk about before we go to uh, any questions is what would be the structure uh, that we envisage taking place here? So I mentioned that we've done the uh, open calls, but at the same time, uh, we have another ARDC program, which is called the Translational Research Data Challenges that we've run in the past year with a, a rather different format. So the Translational Research Data Challenges, instead of working through open calls, has had very focused uh, consultations, working groups and discussions to really bring together uh, the identification of the needs and the scope for the particular project. And I do think that we would be striving to follow that consultative pathway uh, to really build consensus in identifying what's required for these projects, rather than any notion that we're going to run an open call and people will bid um, and these are isolated things that, that go away into silos. So this is really the time for building uh, very, very strong links in the relevant community. That's the aim. Um, we'll see how much uh, convergence we, we see in those ideas as we move forward. Um, so that's about how. Uh, another important consideration to talk about is the co-investment expectations. Now, we're an increased capability. The plan will be uh, undertaken as part of um, the increase, the increase guidelines and the increase principles, and they do require us to maximize co-investment as we are able to. Um, we have already in our programs recognized the impact of COVID, uh, the very difficult financial um, conditions that are facing the sector at the moment and the constraints that people are challenging, challenged with. And therefore in recognition of that, of course, we're very sympathetic uh, and trying to balance the need to secure co-investment, um, which we still have to strive to do um, with the pragmatic approach for what's possible uh, and recognizing that we still do need to secure cash co-investment, but there are other ways of having very, very valuable in-kind, uh, very valuable, actually essential in-kind contributions for these projects. Uh, to be successful. Uh, so I think those are really some of the key messages. We've spoken about the defined areas, the timelines and the next steps and the co-investment. Um, and I think that is actually where I will pause and uh, take questions. So I'll stop sharing this. Now, um, we have a very large number of people on the call today. So thank you very much for um, joining and participating. It's sitting at 100 people at the moment. Uh, so if you could uh, drop any questions into the chat and Ian Duncan, our Director of Outreach, um, is going to moderate the questions for us. So Ian. Yep, thanks, Rosie. So we've got a couple of questions from uh, Douglas Robertson. The first one is, do we have an indicative timeline for the activity plan completion? Uh, no, we, we don't. Um, so the, I think actually we don't have the timeline for when we expect the contract to arrive with us. Um, and this is something that I'm chasing. Um, so that's the, that's the big unknown when the contract comes through. However, uh, the, the first step is actually the appointment of the program manager uh, because we can progress and start the discussions around completion of activity plans in advance of that contract signature date. So with the expectation that the um, recruitment process uh, takes place in the next couple of weeks or certainly opens in the next couple of weeks. Um, we would be looking to have someone on board, uh, certainly before the, the Easter break and their first task is those activity plans. So we will just keep working away at that. Right. 
um, the second question. And do please tap your questions into chat if you've got any. Um, the second question again from Douglas is, will the department expect co-investment from state governments as this has caused challenges for other NCRIS facilities? Um, the, the question I can answer by simply considering ARDC's operations already, uh, the nature of e-research infrastructure has made it much, much harder for state governments to um, invest. Uh, and at this stage, we haven't had to, we, we haven't been um, held back uh, by the absence of state government funding, it would be very welcome, um, but it is not a um, prerequisite for the program to go forward. Right, there's one from Howard. Uh, Trove is excellent, but much of the Indigenous data is in mu museum collections in Australia and globally. Will that material data also be included? Um, Howard, that is a, a specific detail about the particular program that I'm not in a position to answer at this stage. Um, we'll, we'll certainly hang on to the question, um, but I can't give you an answer today. Uh, one from Steve McEkin. Regarding co-investment, there's been a significant level of co-investment into the various ARDC and related programs, so platforms, data partnerships and so on. It may be beneficial to look at how the co-investment in those projects may be considered in combination with the co-investment expectations for the HAS I program. Steve, you're trying to count the money twice. Yeah, I'm not getting away with that. I can see you on the screen. <laughs> um, we will do what we can um, and be pragmatic about this. It was definitely worth a try, Steve. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you can't count the same dollar twice. <laughs> okay, one from uh, Katrina Grant. In terms of the Trove Researcher platform, what other corpora are in scope? Focus on Trove precludes a lot of other collections. Uh, so I can't comment on um, the, the specific details other than saying that we have to follow the identified uh, components as I've set out previously. Can I add one um, thing to this? So it's really useful if people remember that this is um, a foundation set of investments, right? So you absolutely right, Trove doesn't cover everything. The social sciences stuff doesn't cover everything and it's aspects of those particular pieces. And so uh, as Rosie referred to earlier, the road mapping is the opportunity for showing how these um, early investments really can make a high impact and, are and fit really nicely together for the community. Um, so you're right, th th there will be a whole bunch of collections and bodies of data and applications and platforms, um, which would be fantastic to have. And these first ones will provide a basis for some of those. And also really, the really important bit is to show that uh, there can be success in developing them. Um, okay, so another one from uh, Nick T. Berger. Can we envisage that the three named programs, excluding Trove, could be considered capabilities in the next roadmap? Um, I'm, I'm reading the next question as well, which is, <laughs> is throwing me off. Uh, we, could, we can put them forward uh, as as ideas for consideration as capabilities in the next roadmap, um, that they would, I, th I think the idea is, um, are they at the right scale? Um, is there some way of connecting things together um, that's, that's required for scaling? To put this in context, there's less than two dozen um, capabilities at the moment and I think we do see those numbers decreasing but I'm not a member of the expert working group this time round and uh, I'm really reading the tea leaves Nick I don't have much more information um, but if we think they should be then we should definitely be saying it. Uh, from Christopher at a, have philanthropic forms of funding been considered? Universities are research providers, not funders. 
Um, every, every type of um, contribution is absolutely valid in this space. And there are some cases where philanthropic funds are the most appropriate funds. And indeed, we're exploring them in the translational research data challenges, the other ARDC uh, component that I spoke about earlier. So it, it's all in scope. Um, another thing, why not industry? Yeah, all of this is possible. Um, just before we get on to Carly's question, there was a comment from Steve, so fair enough. He's not trying to count things twice, but that there has already been quite a lot of requests for co-investment. Um, I think, again, as Rose, you referred to earlier, that's why we're really trying to be very accommodating and flexible in terms of what co-investment is and means and can be. And it's uh, cash is king, but it's not the only valuable co-investment. Um, okay, so a question from Kylie. Uh, can you give us an outline of governance structure and advisory processes for the program? Um, Kylie, that's a, a critical question. Um, and at this stage, this is it's not something that we have um, matured ready for conversation. It will be an important component once we get the program manager on board. Uh, Richard, so an ARDC question. The Indigenous Data Network is mentioned in the Indigenous task. Does IDN have a specific role in this activity? Uh, yes, IDN does, as, as outlined in the dot points. Thanks, Richard. Uh, from uh, another one from Howard. Many of the Indigenous community users are in remote regions with poor digital connection. And in the case of cultural data, including language, how are we going to facilitate access? Um, Howard, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> but if that's one of the challenges that we have to uh, consider to be successful in this part of the project, um, then we'll have to address it. And, and I, I think it's not confined uh, in the current environment, even with people working from home in big cities, I'm seeing some real technological challenges. Um, but keeping that in mind, they, they will need to be other ways of making sure that input is heard. Has anybody else got a question? Oh, here we go. Uh, Anna Johnston, is there an expectation that all four programs will be consistent in their approach and development? While some of the identified programs seem to be researcher driven, e.g. the Linguistics Data Commons, the Trove program would seem to be led by the National Library. Um, so, the, very, very clearly, this is being undertaken as part of the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy. Uh, so, we're doing this to, to create uh, the environment and the assets for research on data. Um, obviously, that data comes from many different places. Um, so I would say that it's a research infrastructure. However, um, I think we need to be very uh, clear that within that, each of these projects are going to be really quite different. Um, and that's okay. That's okay. There is a set of requirements that we have to meet. We have to meet the NCRIS principles. We're going to need to make sure that we have the activity plans uh, on an annual basis and the progress reports against those activity plans. But beyond that, we have um, definitely the ability to nurture and support each of these uh, projects in the way that best suits them. So if you think about it, the, the activity plan we have to put down exactly what it is we're trying to achieve and then come back and report against it. And that there isn't any intention to have a cookie cutter uh, approach across each of the four. Notwithstanding that, we do feel that there is definitely the opportunity to enhance connection between these projects, uh, across these projects or with other projects in a way that shares knowledge, shares best practice, uh, enables people to build on the work of each other and not have to uh, devise 
each of their solutions from scratch each time. So um, docking in to uh, even the, the broader e-research infrastructure space is something that we will be hoping to uh, drive forward with these programs. All right, one from Angeletta. What's, what's the overall time frame allocated to the Haas investment? Um, my expectation at the moment is that it's to June 2023 as the conclusion of the project. Uh, that gets harder and harder when we don't have the start date, but um, since, since ARDC is able to support the recruitment of the program manager and, those, and drive forward those initial discussions on the activity plan, um, we're really working to make sure that that's not an impediment. From Nick Teberger again, is it likely that the funds will be split four ways with ARDC keeping some? How much? Christian Mark for admin. Um, so the first thing, ARDC will recruit the program manager and that will be funded um, from the 8.9 million. Uh, we will not apply any kind of top slicing. Um, so there, there's not going to be a percentage cut on these things at all. Um, there may be some absolute costs um, that are incurred to undertake the project. In the digital world, they're a lot less. We're not paying for the tea and biscuits for uh, the, the consultations. Um, we're not flying a program manager around the country in the way that we would have done previously. Uh, obviously, I, I do think that um, subject to the, the constraints around borders, uh, the ability to have this person engage deeply and face to face where possible with people um, will be very critical. So direct costs um, that would come from the project. Uh, yes, but there, there won't be any kind of administration overhead imposed. Um, do I see the funds will be split four ways? Well, they'll definitely be split into four, um, but I don't have any preconceptions about whether it will be evenly or, or, or anything else. You know, that, that's something that we will be looking at the activity plans. What are we delivering in the activity plan and how much does it cost to do that? Uh, okay, Sandra Silka asks, following on from the theme of foundational investment, could you clarify what, if any, expectations the department and ARDC has that partner institutions are providing baseline facilities, for example, institutional research data repositories, keeping in mind the context of HASS being long tail, many researchers and many collections, how does ARDC its role, if any, in ensuring this kind of baseline is in place at the institutions? and that those facilities are supportive of overall national research data reuse objectives, both FAIR and CARE for Indigenous? That's a really long question for me, Ian. Um, Sandra, maybe if I, I can paraphrase, but you tell me if I get it wrong, but it's basically HASS is, uh, you know, HASS data becomes more valuable as it gets older, and there's a lot of it, and often small, not big collections, some big, some small. Uh, is the question to what extent is ARDC making sure that the institutions themselves are providing the underpinning infrastructure to make sure that all of those pieces don't get lost um, and also that the institutions are more generally supportive of FAIR and CARE. So um, do we have other programs that um, encourage institutions to be good data custodians and good data stewards. Sandra, you, you're very happy. You, you're very welcome to speak here. I can I can see. Um, your, Hello, your name. Hi. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, look. Yeah. I th look. Um, that's a good summation of uh, Ian said there. Of um, I'm just wondering what are ARDC's assumptions about what support is out there already for, for Haas? And, and I think you, you vaguely alluded it, to it in a previous answer, sort of generally about the e-research space. And okay. I'm wondering, are you, you know, what, what do you expect institutions to be providing? 
Um, if anything. Some, yeah, I, I think expect is probably the difficult word here. Um, because I think what you're talking about is a, a question of um, whose responsibility is it longer term to deal with the tsunami, as it's being described, of uh, data, not just in the HASS space. Um, some of the collections might be smaller in the HASS space, but you know they're still acute. So what you're, what you're touching on um, really is, I don't think that we have expectations, but we have concerns that somewhere in the system, someone, it's got to happen. It has got to happen. So um, the way that we are addressing this at the moment is we're working to change the conversation from saying to institutions or others, you must provide X amount of storage to a consideration of what is it that's being stored? How can we ensure that the storing of data, um, and by that I mean fair data, is optimized? And so we have done one pilot program, we're about to um, launch another very, very soon. Um, that works with the institutions and the NCRIS capabilities to identify uh, collections with particular associated metadata and work with them to or incentivize the improvement of metadata associated with that collection and then and pay for that to happen. Now, what we would like to do is to be able to submit into um, the next road mapping process we're creating the framework where you can make a very considered judgment about what it is you're storing. And with that improved knowledge, you can better understand how much it's going to cost for that to happen. Okay, so I, I don't think we're saying we expect institutions to do X, Y, and Z. We say there is a real need uh, the need continues to grow. And unless we put in place the framework whereby we can make reasonable decisions about what's stored and what isn't stored, we won't survive this. So by being able to say uh, that data that's being collected from a microscope, um, you've got a hundred image, but actually we know how to recapture that. We don't need to keep all hundred images. We might keep one image and the protocol for reacquiring that data in contrast to another collection that we can't reacquire. So it's that greater knowledge. So that was a bit of a long answer, but it was a long question and a really big question that's, that's relevant to all Australian research. There are, in fact, there are another couple of questions from Marco uh, and Ryan, which are similar in the sense of the sustainability of the outputs. Um, if if your aren't if your questions weren't answered, if you could just drop a little note, and then we might do a written answer to that. That's that's something which would be good for us to write down. There was also a comment from Douglas Robertson about that critical nature of governance, which I think we absolutely agree on. Um, really, that's yes. a key component. Um, Peter Riley um, has a question regarding the Indigenous uh, Data Network dot point. Um, really, is the uh, you pointed to the dot point that references the named role of IDN. Is the IDN therefore the single or primary vehicle pathway or pathway through which Indigenous research capability is expected to be supported? Um, I think again we're at the stage of um, I'm not presupposing what will be in this project, but certainly uh, the conversation will be started with the, the program manager and with the IDN in the formation of the activity plan. Uh, Len Smith makes a comment which I think again refers a little bit to the underpinning infrastructures that it really is key to make sure that those ICT infrastructures, but also the people infrastructures, there's a sustainability path for those. Um, if I've paraphrased that incorrectly, Len, then let me know. Uh, Stephanie von Govel has a question. How will ARDC move these foundational 
or quite limited in scope in some aspects activities to broader scale and application? Um, so I, I think the point here is um, ARDC itself is only funded through to June 2023 at this stage, the same as these particular projects. Um, when we're going through the activity plans, there will be things that we're capturing and saying, yes, this is in the um, uh, scope of the project at the moment. These things aren't in scope. And then we would submit those to the road mapping process. Um, but at this stage, I can't say what the federal government investment will be beyond June 2023. Um, I certainly can't say that I would see these activities as an ongoing um, ARDC stream. But I, I think on their, um, if you consider a HAS and an Indigenous Research Data Commons, uh, I could definitely see that being a capability um, on its own. So a new increase capability running, but, but I don't know. I don't know. Uh, question from Katie Wilson. Will care and fair data principles be managed for accountability or monitored at some level? And if so, by whom? Um, the ARDC's um, underpinning work is to advance the fair and care agenda. Uh, obviously the, the, the fair data uh, agenda has a, a longer um, timeline behind it, but all of our work is in that space. Uh, the data retention program that I mentioned previously is absolutely at looking at how we improve um, the metadata associated with a particular collection. But it won't be a case of um, ARDC or anyone else externally policing something. In the activity plan, there has to be some consideration given to, well, this is what we are building. This is how we will judge it. Uh, interesting question from Peter Riley. So extending on from the care and fair are increasingly emerging focus within indigenous data research is indigenous data sovereignty. This is a complex and systemic question and one that warrants a national consideration, including around storage and custo custodianship of any data that relates to indigenous Australians. Do you see this as a component of this next stage of work? Can I just ask really quickly, do you mean this stage of work or the subsequent stages of work? Maybe you could answer um, I guess both, this, this stage and, and then following on into the next stages. Yeah, thanks. Um, Peter, I think the, the um, concept of data sovereignty uh, is a, a critical consideration um, and one that the design of the activities has to consider in the same way um, we, we think about uh, sensitive data in the health context. You know, data has a particular information uh, payload associated with it. And um, I would expect that this is a key consideration. And it's the reason that we don't build uh, a single massive data center for storage and say absolutely everything in Australia has to sit in this space. Which is a terrible pity, Rosie. Yes, I know. I so didn't drop you in that, Ian. <laughs> uh, a question from uh, Stephanie. Uh, how will ARDC connect with all the other government, uh, government agendas with respect to Indigenous data and digital platforms, OIATSIS, NIAA, Productivity Commission and so on? Who is coordinating here? Is ARDC going to take up this role? Uh, yes, and that will sit within the remit of the program manager. Um, it's, it's obviously a critical part of the communication strategy and so building those linkages and working to ensure um, the transparency and openness of the next stages of the programme are, are completely critical. 
but I, I do see it is a key responsibility on ARDC to make sure that we get the right people um, feeling that they have every opportunity that they want to contribute to the discussion. Good question from Ingrid. What are the hallmarks of success through this program for the ARDC and for the four groups outlined? Um, so there's two things. One, we write an activity plan and do what we said we'd do. That's really simple. And as a result of that, we create some fantastic outcomes and the ability for um, significant support for both those and a broader scope is picked up in the next roadmap. That, I'm not saying anything particularly surprising there. You know, do a really good job and demonstrate that this um, a broad cohort, I'm not going to lump all the projects in together, it's a very, very broad cohort, uh, but is recognised as um, a, a mature and appropriate vehicle for future investment. I don't have any more questions in the list. Has anybody got anything they'd like to put forward? Okay, um, so the purpose for today was obviously not to leave too long a gap um, following October's announcement and bring us together and start some of these conversations. So thank you for all of your questions. Um, obviously, you'll see that the details in each of the projects I'm unable to answer at the moment because we do need to appoint that program manager and have the fuller discussions. Um, but nevertheless, it's appropriate to capture these questions and take them forward going into the discussions. Um, the increased testing of the ideas jam is ongoing at the moment. Um, and in the, the, the same time, the finalization of that position description is, is really um, in the next few days. And so I think the important thing from today is uh, for me to say that as soon as we have this um, job advert published and out there, the first thing we will do is uh, circulate that link to you and ask you to, um, again, pass that on to your networks or stick your hand up there could be someone there today that's just the person to join us as the program manager. I don't know, I can't see all the faces, uh, but you might well be listening. So the position um, will go out very shortly and um, it will be open um, probably for somewhere between two to four weeks and we'll press on with that. So that's the next step. Uh, during that time, we are still very, very happy for you to um, log questions with us, uh, but some of these we really won't be able to advance until we have the program manager and we can move forward with some um, constructive and productive uh, stakeholder discussions around writing up those activity plans. Okay. So thank you all very much indeed for joining us this morning. Um, it shows the, the depth of support and commitment uh, for these very important projects. And I look forward to speaking with you over the coming weeks. Thanks a lot.